Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good evening, wherever you are. I'm Aubrey Bergauer. I am coming at you from Rome right now. I've been traveling if you've been following me the past couple weeks. So buongiorno, buonasera, wherever you are, wherever you're joining us from. I'm so glad you're here. This is week seven of 10 of a series called The Narrative Is Changing. And it's all about how the, the narrative for classical music, for arts and culture more broadly, is changing. The pandemic has accelerated so much change in so many different ways around us. And our industry, for sure, has been a part of that change and acceleration. So this is all part of the LinkedIn Creator Accelerator Program. So I just want to thank LinkedIn for... Um, bringing making it possible to bring this content to you they've been really supportive of this work and to get into our topic today a little bit and then i'll introduce our guest uh when i talk about the narrative is changing and specifically this week's topic of fundraising what do i mean by that well what i mean is i am hearing from more and more organizations more and more board members more and more staff members even musicians, I would say sometimes, artists saying, we cannot continue to rely on the big donors at the top of the pyramid. We know that we are over relying on those big gifts. Not that we don't love those gifts because we all do, but we know we're, we're too beholden to that. That's a shift in the narrative for sure. We are also hearing things like, we need a plan for younger donors. Whereas a few years ago, all I was hearing was young donors don't give, millennials don't give. We know that's not true, right? We're hearing more and more, no, we need a plan. We know we need uh, values alignment and that's how we will recruit new and younger donors. So we're gonna get into all this in just a minute, but that's what I mean by the narrative is changing. We are hearing different things than we did even just two years ago and that is a good thing. So. If step one is that the narrative is changing, then step two is how do we how do we respond to that? What do we actually do about it besides just talk about it, right? So our guest today is going to tell us all kinds of good things about that. And I just want to encourage everybody as we're going here, please use the chat, the comments on LinkedIn. Uh, we see them on this end. We'll respond to them. If you have questions, I'll bring those up at the end. Uh, if you just want to cheer our guests on, that's fine too. Whatever you want to do, we want to hear from you for sure. So please, please, please participate. And let me introduce our guest. We have today, I'm going to turn his video on here, Luis Diaz. And Luis is currently executive director of annual giving at Muhlenberg College. And he also knows classical music. So everybody in the arts world, this is a great guest. Uh, Lewis has fundraised inside the arts and outside the arts. And yes, I love the props, that's awesome. And uh, more specifically, Lewis worked at the Baltimore Symphony from 2017 to 2019. He was director of the annual fund there. And he's a player, viola, right? Viola player, yeah. Yep in the Knoxville Symphony. So again, just really knows the art form and knows the nuances of fundraising, um, like I said, within the arts and outside of the arts. So on top of all that, before I ever even knew of Lewis's performing arts background, I was attracted to his work here on LinkedIn. So the quality of his posts are just, just always blow my mind, to be honest. Lewis is such a thought leader on how to engage donors, how to become better, stronger, more relevant fundraisers and more relevant organizations. And so I was following his work for a long time with just knowing him as a thought leader and a great content producer. Then fast forward to a few months ago, and we both found out that we were both accepted into the LinkedIn Accelerator program. So I just was so excited that of the 100 participants selected among thousands of applicants, like I knew somebody, so or at least like virtually knew somebody. So I'm extra excited for this conversation <laughs> to bring Louis to you all. Okay, so... One more quick uh, administrative point, um, please, if you think this conversation is relevant to anybody in your feed, anybody in your network, please share this, whether you are watching live now or you're watching online later, spread the word about this conversation we're having if you think it would benefit others. That would be really, really wonderful to see that. Okay, so let's uh, let's hit it. I'm just gonna dive in with questions. Like I said, everybody use the chat, use the comments oh my if you wanna. Chime in. Okay. So my first question for you, Lewis, is you created the Donor Participation Project. And mm -hmm. that, I, I want to hear, first of all, what that is. But my okay. understanding is that you created that in response to 
a significant decline in donor participation across the entire nonprofit sector. What, what I've mm -hmm. heard you say, what I've read on your website, 20 million households lost. Everybody, let me repeat that. 20 million households lost. Uh, these are donor households we're talking about between the years 2000 and 2016. So tell us what the Donor Participation Project is. Tell us um, what, what you're seeing at your own institution or other places you've worked, what the project is doing in response, all of that. Oh my goodness. Aubrey, can I be a really bad guest and go a little bit off topic to say yes. how much um, I admire you. Um, this is, uh, so I had a boss and uh, Jamie Kelly, if you're listening to this, um, he would show up in the office and he was kind of a, you know, a visionary revolutionary guy. He'd show up with this article about um, this person, Aubrey Bergauer, who's really shaking things up and he would distribute it, you know, and then some people would love him. Others would say, Ugh, you know, so, um, and, you know, and now we're, we're here today. So I'm very honored and grateful. Uh, <laughs> So Donor Participation Project, really quickly, it's a fundraiser community. We're at 1,100 plus now, a little bit over that, um, growing every day. We have, uh, you know, I don't know, 10 to 20 signups every day. And um, basically what we started to do is get together every month because um, we were seeing what you just noted, what the people in the arts no are noticing, what people in every nonprofit sector that relies on individual donors is seeing is that donors down dollars up. Um, and then all of the advice when you went out there and you tried to go on LinkedIn and find out what to do about it was, we'll do another campaign and ask your top 1% for, you know, it was like, there's a disconnect here. Right. Um, so we thought, well, nobody's going to have the answer because if they did, then we wouldn't be here, but at least let's start talking about it, finding research, finding pieces of this that people solved. And we've connected with some, uh, great people, including in the arts. And we were talking about the Washington chorus a little bit earlier. Um, in the pre-show talk, um, but and just try to learn from each other. So we get together every month. It's free to join. Um, highly recommended um, for my folks. Uh, and since we're, we're we're streaming to my network too, please connect with Aubrey. I always find that it's most inspirational when you find somebody who's like not totally separate, but not totally kind of inside your area of expertise, right? And there's so much to learn from from Aubrey. So please connect with her. That means um, but that's it. Awesome. Okay, so let's talk about change. You and I, one of the reasons we get along so well is because we both are championing change. And you talk a lot about changing fun, fundraising practices. So what what specifically is the question I have on this? What specifically needs to change? What are you what are you seeing like that you just want to bang your head against the wall or good things? We're talking about the narrative is changing, like what in your mind's not working and, and we need to do it differently? My goodness, that's a really good question. Um, and I think the arts have a, like so much going for them because some of those pieces are like built in. So for example, the fact that you typically want to have a cycle that has with, starts with some type of invitation, then is some type of engagement or of showing the work, you know, of you know bringing people in into kind of a more community type um feeling or or relationship and then an ask so you need all you need all of that right so some people say lewis you mean you just have to engage people and they'll give on their own well no you know you still have to ask them but um and the and and honestly i, I see almost every shop um has um uh, has under invested in the engagement piece and that is like the and you talk about it you know when you talk about subscriptions etc that's kind of the value provide that's what people want that's what they're there for that's how you provide value to them kind of in exchange it's not an exchange right but that's why they stick around um so that's a little bit of the i would say like the big picture you know invest more in communicating in human authentic bi-directional ways um a lot of the marketing that happens in you know in arts and in non arts nonprofits is very one way, you know, very like ads. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then when you at, when you do ask them, try to get them into ways of giving that kind of ensure that they'll stick around like monthly giving subscriptions, you know, um, or there are other ways to do it, but that's a very popular one. 
So. Yeah, I think I think what's so interesting about that answer for anybody who, whether you watched last week on the subscription economy or almost any other week of this series, like I said, we're on week seven now. So almost any other week, communication has been this recurring theme, no, ma no matter the topic, like customer centric communication, in this case, donor centric communication. And I've just, um, it's funny, I'm known for marketing communications, but um, I don't know, it's just really been an interesting through line of like, wow, it's so critical in everything we do to communicate this well, which you're saying is part of this engagement piece. And I totally agree. So love it. Okay. Um, actually, funny enough, my next question is continuing on this line of communication. So um, we, we generally do a poor job, again, this is sort of picking up right where I just left off, I think, of, of communicating with our donors. And um, I guess my, my question here is why though? Why is this happening? If, if we're hearing more and more this matters and, and we've got to center these people and not just treat them like a piggy bank, but actually engage. Um, and by communication, just so everybody hears me, it's not just the next annual fund appeal. That's not, that is a communication, but that's not engagement. That's just- Or the awesome. once per year what? annual report. You know, that's not cutting it. Say more, like what, like what oh. is, why, is it because, why are we so bad at communicating? Is it because we have lean teams? That's a real reason. We got to talk about how to combat that. Are there other mm -hmm. reasons? I mean, I'm really curious. What's your take on this? Okay. So one, I, I would say underinvestment. So a lot of kind of the ethos also of the donor participation project was that lots of the advice were, you know, you're a bad fundraiser. You're, you know, you should be on the phone all day. And it's like, people are you know, they're using 23 hours out of the day, they, they can't like possibly do more. So under investment. Second, thinking of marketing as, um, you know, something that used using paradigms that used to work. So focusing on the institution, focusing a lot on marketing ad spend, um, making that the primary um, we had a fantastic thought leader in marketing at, at a donor participation project session uh, last week called Mark Schaefer. And he said, the marketing funnel is dead. People I love want, oh my God, I okay. love Mark Schaefer. Continue. I'll send you the link. I'll send mm -hmm. you because it's, it's, this, this guy was, you know, amazing. So um, he has a book, uh, Marketing Rebellion. And what he essentially is saying is what we're seeing all the time is that that personal people want to connect with people on LinkedIn. So it's, in a way, Aubrey, it's almost like all those things that fundraisers always knew are starting like to bleed into marketing. Um, yes. Where, you know, it's like more personal, it's more one-on-one. -on -one. You have to find ways to scale it, of course. But, um, you know, so a, a little bit of that is we're not doing enough. So part of it is also the volume of content. So, I mean, how many of us have not heard, oh my goodness, we're, we're going to bother people or we're over communicating. That doesn't exist anymore. And there's a question in the chat now um, from Alexander, who says, how do we break through the hype? Well, one of the things to do is to share stories that are authentic, that are relatable, that have some type of, you know, a call to action, not necessarily, you know, always give now, but that have some type of action um, and share just a lot of them, put them out there. The algorithms will take care of them. If people like them, they will share them. You know, um, it's a new world. And the nonprofit is not the one who that's determining what is news and what isn't anymore. So before it used to be that, you know, uh, the, 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 you know, I don't know where symphony would say, this is what's happened and we're going to send a magazine and this is the reality. Now your donors are connecting in a group chat. they have a WhatsApp channel. They're on Facebook and they're actually saying, this isn't true. You know, this happened. And I heard from the concert master that um, you guys are horrible and yada, yada. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, What's so great about everything you're saying is, I mean, again, we're so aligned on so many things, but um, I frequently say marketing and development are not that different. And that's what you're saying. Like development is marketing and in the scale is different. Yes. But um, especially when we're talking about something like annual fund, that is much more similar to marketing because it is more mass communication as we're moving toward, this is my take at least, as we're moving toward major donors, then that does, um, it's more one-on-one -on -one as we're moving toward those bigger and bigger gifts. But um but this idea, I say all the time, marketing is education. And more and more, I'm saying marketing is also, or fundraising is marketing, marketing is education. That gets into the storytelling, that gets into the content. Like, no. anyways, it's a whole nother week, a really sneak preview. We're on another week, we're going to talk about our siloed teams and how do we change that. And all, But this is like the preamble to that conversation of like, mm -hmm. it's not that different. This work is actually very um 
holistic in that way. Very similar, I believe. So, okay. Um, let's talk about millennial donors. So I said it at the top. I'll say it again. The conversation used to be, they don't give. Mm -hmm. And we know now that is not correct. And you know, it's so funny. I mean, I'm, a, I'm technically a millennial. I'm like the oldest millennial out there. I'm almost 40, you know? And so it's like, this is, this is an age range that does, we can't say they don't give. We now have proof that that's not true. So um, what have you learned though? What have you learned about millennial donors? What have you learned about how arts organizations can better fundraise from this group? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. So when I was um, at a symphony, um, a lot of the annual funds and, you know, we, we had a whole big confusion and conversations about membership and annual fund and, you know, all of that, but it was very transactional, right? And one of the, and that is working less and less and, you know, and it's especially not working among those younger demographics. So um, a couple of thoughts here. We had a session with a donor participation project um, with a research from researcher from um, Harvard Divinity School um, and she's now at a company called Sacred Design Lab. And she did a, a, a study with um, analyzing organizations that were doing really well with millennials. And it was not only nonprofits, it was like CrossFit and the dinner table. And, you know, and the big takeaway is that people come for something, for a workout, for food, for painting, but they stick around for the community. Okay. And then that got me on a really kind of, um, long exploration of what community is. And I try to distill that down into um, a definition that's communities when people get together in ways that are purposeful, participatory, recurring, and identify leaders. So, you know- say that, say that again. This I feel like we should be taking notes. Say it again. Oh my goodness. So communities where people get together, obviously. So you need people and they need to get together. There's no, a bit of community, okay? In ways that are participatory. So it's a two-way thing. Right. We want to not only and you can do social media in a way that's participatory or not really. So it doesn't really, you know, the medium doesn't really matter. It's how you use it. So um, it has to be a conversation. It has to be purposeful. So people want to, you know, if you have a group of symphony volunteers and all they do is get around to, um, you know, pardon my friends, but complain, you know, about how bad the champagne is. You know, that's not purposeful. So there has to be a clear purpose to and then you can also have fun right it has to be recurring so you don't build community if it's one-off things and we i see that a lot in kind of schools where we do this great event it's amazing and it just happened once um so um things like the donor participation project we meet every month you know it's built into the design um and then you identify leaders so since staff can't do it all at the beginning staff can kind of be the leaders but you want to develop um volunteers who can kind of take that and you've seen that like Aubrey, like with, um, I know some symphonies do like supporter dinners. I think where you kind of develop a package and you train the volunteers and then they go and they do it. Those mm -hmm. models, you know, work well. Yeah. Um, so that community piece um, seems to be critical and so kind of what the market seems to be demanding for millennials and others, honestly. Uh, yes, exactly. There is no age range to people who want that community by that definition. I, I believe that wholeheartedly. Um, okay, that's great. Thank you for that. So just I want to call I want to name Lydia's question here. Is it worth noting when talking about millennials that most arts organizations don't accept Venmo or PayPal? I I'm I would love to hear your thoughts. I get very hyper about our website and our like these like technology. Yeah, I did all your work. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Huh. Okay. I'm gonna share two ideas that are against each other, so they're contrary. One is, yes, you need to diminish friction as much as possible. Venmo does that, PayPal does it. There are platforms that integrate, um, and lots of people do trust PayPal a whole lot, and you'll be, you know, you think that's every org I've worked with, and, uh, you know, I've helped put PayPal on their giving site, they were surprised. So it's just like, it always happens, I don't know why. So um, number one. Number two, you are trying to build a community of supporters and it's not necessarily so not every donor that you acquire is as good as the other so you know not all i, I say this like not all donor not our new donors are created equal yeah right um so things like if you want people who are going to stick around with you and things like giving days giving tuesday that type of 
mentality that you attract is not the type that sticks around with you. Um, right. So that's like, so for instance, monthly gifts. So that's not Venmo. You might, you, I think you can do it on PayPal. Um, less people convert, but what you get over time, it adds up and it builds a much more sustainable organization. Um, there's, I did a study for a, a, a really large public research university um, and the cutoff point where you could really see how those major gifts um, started to increase was after people were giving for three years in a row. So that's the amount of time it takes if you have the capacity and the inclination, all of that. But on average, you know, you need to be around an organization that long. Yeah, that's great. So. Great intel. Okay. I want to talk about monthly giving a little bit, and then I see a couple more questions in the comments. So we'll come back to that. Anybody else, Ooh. if you have questions, please drop them in the comments. I'm going to get to them very soon, but first monthly giving. So we've touched on it a couple times already. And last week, again, for anybody who watched on the subscription economy, we talked about how most subscription brands outside of the arts make the customer opt out of the subscription. We all know if we don't want Netflix anymore, we have to cancel that ourselves. Whereas in the arts, and especially this is true with season subscriptions, this is true with annual fund often, we opt out for the donor and say, would you like to give again? Would you like to opt back in? Whereas monthly giving, I know the pros are like, what happens when their credit card changes and we got to chase that down? And you know, it, it maybe administratively feels like a burden. I don't know, I've heard the pros and cons, but I'm very curious, you're in it, you do the work on a day-to-day -day basis. Monthly giving, good, bad. <laughs> what are your thoughts? Yeah. Like, like a rocket ship. So, but I, I don't want to be like uh, flippant about this. Um, we did a ton of research. My school, I think, is uh, the only one or one of the very few. I haven't seen any others who act that actually transformed the entire operation to be monthly giving first. So I why did we that. do that? Hey, tell us everything. I did not know that about you. So go ahead. Okay. So if you go to give dot Muhlenberg edu and i'll let you guess how you spell Muhlenberg. um you'll see that all the forms default to monthly um and we did this we started to do this work at the, at the baltimore symphony too um why so we had a, another session at the donor participation project with a public radio director and um her name is nicole stern and she was amazing See, but what she shared was that monthly giving is not an add-on. It's a change in model. And you hear that too when you read interviews with the founder of Charity Water, um, who was talking with all his kind of Silicon Valley connections. And they were saying, if you're going to be a subscription company, like you have to be a subscription company. You can't like half, you know, half, do it halfway. Um, sure. So I just want to chime in and say Charity Water is like my go-to case study for successful monthly giving. I think they've done an exceptional job. Well, and you know, there, there, there's always lots of opinions. And it, every time I put a statistic out there, there are like five people who, who have a different one. But I kind of, you know, we're all kind of fumbling our way around trying to tease out what the future is and what the path is that we want to create for ourselves. If you look at how many donors have stopped giving just to nonprofits, probably since, you know, 08, in the last, another statistic from um, the um, School of Philanthropy at Indiana University, um, so there were two thirds of house of a U.S. households giving every year, ten years ago. Now that's down to half. So it's equivalent to what you shared earlier, Aubrey. So if you look at organizations that have increased their number of donors, okay, and I've 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 looked you know everywhere I could, you find some research from Blackbaud in public media. Mm. Those have have they're hanging on to their number and it's growing. So, you know, how amazing is that when everybody else is on the decline, right? And yeah. then Charity Water, of course, is going through the roof. I heard from somebody who's um, closely involved with them that they're at 70,000 monthly donors. Their goal for this year is 100,000. Wow. So, um, you know, I don't know what the way forward is. You know, nobody has all the answers, but that seems like a pretty good bet. Yeah. Well, I mean, I always, we're having a conversation about how the narrative is changing and everything I do is how talking about what needs to change. And if we know if the old way is not working, then let's try something different. So I just, oh my gosh, I'm like totally drinking this up. This is awesome. Okay. So let me turn to some of these questions in the comments here. So um, shifting gears a little bit, um, corporate giving. So what, what uh, corporate giving also definitely has been on the decline. So say more about that. Is there anything that you've seen that's working? The, or do you think it's just not where the juice is not worth the squeeze? What are your thoughts?
Uh oh, did I lose you? I think we might have lost you, Lewis. I'm not sure if it's my connection here or if it's yours there. We'll give it a minute. I'm just scanning these other comments here too. Cameron says, people that we can retain are much better for our donor health. Thank you for affirming that. Yes, absolutely. Danielle says, automatic opt-in. Could not agree more with this. Yes, however, not always easy to convince organizations this is the right way. 100% convincing people of change is difficult. Okay, we definitely lost Lewis here. He'll join us again in a second. Um, I think, well, Danielle, just to respond to that, I, this is why I became so data-driven because way back early in my career when I was championing change, no matter the topic, um, I just learned that to come armed with data makes so much of a difference versus this is Aubrey's opinion or just a case study of a one-off organization. That all helps. But um, to have these statistics of the decline in donor households or the success statistics of not just a charity water, but as Lewis was saying, any organization he's seen able to um, have an increase in annual fund donors, it's because monthly giving was a component. So yeah, not always easy to convince the organization. Absolutely true. Lydia says, I think he's frozen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so, well, I'm gonna keep riffing here. Let's see here. Um, I think what we'll do, we are close to being done on our time. So maybe I'll just wrap it up. And if he joins, we'll maybe hit another question or two. But I will end uh, us today by saying that um, Lewis really is awesome. I have, I have said this at the top, but I'll say it again. I've been so attracted to his work and his thought leadership and even just the glimpse we got today into that. I think he's very... Um, just balanced in how he approaches the pros, the cons, what the what he's seeing as trends, what he's hearing from others, and just really sort of reconciling all of that. So please give him a follow if you're not following him already. I think I just really respect him and his work um, in fundraising. And follow the Donor Participation Project. Uh, he is working on a conference that's coming up. So definitely follow, follow, follow. And like I said, if you like what you heard in this conversation today, I see these great um, comments coming through. Ashley says, thank you. Really great information. You're so, you're so welcome. Thank you for the comment. Um, anybody else like that, if you're thinking this was helpful, please share it, give it a like, uh, share it to your feeds. Oh my God, Tracy Wolf. Ah, uh, so good to see you. So um, it's helpful to get the word out to everybody who is also looking to improve and change their fundraising practices. So um, give it a like, give it a share and follow me if you're not already. If you want more change making content, uh, if you want tips in your feed, I talk all about changing the narrative for all kinds of topics within the arts and outside the arts. And um, one more time, I just want to thank LinkedIn for uh, the Creator Accelerator Program and making this series possible. I said before, this is week seven of 10. And so we've got three more weeks left. We've got a few more awesome topics on how the narrative is changing, even if just a little bit is changing for the better. So with that, um, I'm going to say good night. Like I said, I'm here in Italy. So I will see you all next week. And we've got another great topic coming your way. So ciao. Bye.